Uh, well, obviously, uh, some of you may not have been caught up on this series. Uh, Eric mentioned this yesterday in the World War I series, that we have a brand new group of students here, which is just delightful. Uh, so it's fun to have most of you here. And I'm kidding. We're excited to have all of you here, uh, I think. But uh, just kidding. Uh, but it, it's just delightful to have a new group. And uh, the difficulty Eric and I were realizing is with doing a longer Daily Thunder series. Last year, uh, each of the semesters kind of had like their own series, uh, which worked out really well. Uh, because you just were in the series from start to end. But this year is a little different. We decided to do one massive series. So Eric's, again, going through World War I, and I'm walking through this series called Soul Drift, talking about this idea of idolatry and altars, and, and what does it mean to drift away from what God has called us to? Uh, so you're kind of jumping into the middle of this. So what I decided for this particular session is I want to kind of give a in one sense, a review, but I want to take, for those who have been going through the series, I want to kind of take this idea of idolatry maybe one step different or look at it from a different angle, if, if that makes any sense. Uh, one of the definitions that we've been defining idolatry with, or at least it's, this has been my go-to definition so far, is looking to anyone or anything besides Jesus to meet my needs. And you could probably define idolatry in a whole variety of ways, but I really like this definition. And the whole thrust of this concept is if, if I'm turning to anything but Jesus, if there's something that I'm trying to satisfy or meet a need inside of my life, outside of him, well, then that's idolatry. So this could be bad stuff. This can be good stuff. This can be religious stuff. So anytime something grabs a hold of me and pulls my attention or tries to satisfy or... or uh, uh, maybe uh, comfort the deep longings of my soul other than Christ, well, that, that's idolatry. Uh, here's a quote I've been reading several times, but Brad Bigney wrote a great book called Gospel Treason, and th this is how he defines it. An idol is anything or anyone that captures our hearts, minds, and affections more than God. So what can be an idol in your life? Anything. I think it's a wonderful reminder that in our lives, see, most of us in the modern church are like, yes, I love Jesus, but I also need this, and I need this, and I also need this in my life to satisfy me. And you realize that whatever the this and the this and the this is, that's idolatry. Is it possible for Jesus to be the centrality of your life? Is it possible for Jesus to be the preeminent one, the one that has first place in your life? the one that has captured your heart and your mind and your life, is it possible for him to have the totality of your affections and nothing else? Uh, several episodes ago, we were talking about this idea of sipping salt water and how we typically will turn to things, and in and of themselves, they may not be bad or evil, but it's like we, we slowly just kind of sip a little bit, and we sip a little bit, and we sip a little bit, but like salt water, salt water is actually a good thing, and yet, if you begin to drink it, it actually makes you thirstier and thirstier and thirstier, and it'll eventually kill you. And that is the same thing with idolatry. And we had a list of things, and I keep adding to it, uh, but here are some, what you could probably call modern idols. Uh, these, are, these are some big things that we typically deal with. Uh, money, sexuality, control, comfort, busyness, people, food, works, wisdom, health, success, time, your job, emotions, pleasure, religion, yourself, technology, social media, status, materialism, celebrities. We are so prone to turn everywhere but Jesus. Isn't it interesting? Psalm 16 verse 11 says that in Christ is the fullness of joy. At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. And if we actually knew that, that Jesus is the fullness of joy, that he is the fullness of pleasure, if Ephesians 2.14 is true, and he is the fullness of our peace. Why on earth would we look to anything else for joy and for satisfaction and for peace, and, and yet we all are so prone to do it? Where it's like, well, yeah, I'm doing the religious thing over here. I've got Jesus. Yay, Jesus. But then I come over here and like, but yeah, I really need some joy. So I'm going to you know, binge watch Netflix for the next three days. Or I'm going to turn to this, or I'm going to turn to that. 
to satisfy me, or I really need some peace in my life, so I need to turn to this, forgetting that the one in whom the fullness of joy is, the one in whom the fullness of peace resides, you have. Peter, in 2 Peter 1.3, says that everything that you need, think about this, everything that you need for life or godliness is found in Christ Jesus. And can you name a single thing that you need outside of life and godliness? Yeah, I can't either. So why would we turn to anything else but Jesus? And yet I'm just as guilty as you are. What I want to do in this particular session is I want us to give name to our idols. I've been really wrestling with this. I've been talking about idolatry, and I've been listing things you know, like this list, in an abstract kind of a sense, like, well, you know your idols, and you do at some level, I really want us to say, Lord, would you pinpoint, would you name the idols in our lives? Because what what I'm realizing is if you don't know what your idol is, how are you ever going to repent of it? How are you going to press into the reality of Christ if you don't know what your idols in your life are? So I want to talk through a variety of concepts with you this morning looking at how how do we define idolatry in our personal lives how do we name the actual idols in our lives uh, a couple weeks ago one of our students said have you have you se- have you seen this it, it was this youtube video by the skit guys and if you've never seen the skit guys they're just these two goofy guys that are getting older and older and older and <laughs> like the rest of us and they had a they had a film on idol worship and for copyright sake and all that kind of stuff I didn't want to show the video but I did transcribe the video it's probably just as bad <laughs> so if they're listening to this please forgive me I'm, I'm asking your forgiveness um, but I'm, I'm encouraging you so here, here's the promotion I'm encouraging you to go watch it it's actually really intriguing but here, here's what they do it, it's a really short video but they they show some pictures and they make this statement so they, you know, they have these pictures of like these tribal characters who, you know, have these headdresses and, you know, painted faces and, and dancing and hooting and hollering. And, and this, is, this is what the gentleman says on the screen. He says, I was watching TV the other day and this show comes on with these religious fanatics. They were crazy. Well, you think they, well, you would think that they were crazy if you didn't understand their culture or their religion. See, that is just the thing. They were worshipers of idols, and they took things to extremes. They painted their bodies. They wore ridiculous costumes. They chanted. They danced. They made sacrifice to their idols. They had built these enormous temples to worship their idols in. It seemed like their entire existence climaxed into this one scenario, this one over-the-top act of worship. And he pauses, and he says this. You don't really relate, do you? Let's try this again. And so they rewind the video, and new pictures start coming on the screen. And it starts showing all these sports games. Now, listen to this afresh. I was watching TV the other day, and this show comes on with these religious fanatics. They were crazy. Well, you would think that they were crazy if you didn't understand their culture or their religion. See, that is just the thing. They were worshipers of idols, and they took things to the extremes. They painted their bodies. They wore these ridiculous costumes. They chanted. They danced. They made sacrifice to their idols. They had built these enormous temples to worship their idols in. It seemed like their entire existence climaxed into this one scenario, this one over-the-top act of worship. And then he drops the ball, and he says this, idol worship. It's not just about golden calves anymore. Have you watched a sports game recently with the painted faces and and all the crazy clothing and all the hooting and the hollering and the chanting and the rah, rah, rah? And I'm not going to say there's anything wrong with a sporting event. I I love going to like high school games. One, usually because I know the people playing. And that to me is actually fun. I can, you know, I can cheer them on. But we as a modern culture, especially in America and around the world, if you put in soccer, right, football, we are fanatical about our sporting events. We will spend countless dollars, countless time, our emotions go up and down, 
We hoot, we holler, we cheer, we sacrifice. In fact, as they ironically pointed out, we have built these massive temples of worship. We just call them stadiums. But isn't that, what the, isn't that what, what's happening? Do you realize how insidious idol worship actually has become in our culture? We don't have like, most of us don't have little Buddha statues we're worshiping down to. We're not bowing down before some idol, some graven image. And yet, in the depth of our being, we are idol worshipers. We just call it something else. There's this interesting idea about going beneath the surface of idolatry. See, most of us look at something and we're craving something and we actually forget that there's actually an underlying reality to the very thing that we're craving. For example, say, say my craving is a brand new car. And I'm like, oh, I just have to have the new car. I really want the new car. You could say, well, that, that's your idol then. And that would be true in a sense if, if my whole focus is wrapped up in the new car. But in, in one reality, that's like a surface level idol. Because there is a deeper idol that is actually controlling that desire, which is what? My reputation, the fact that I want to be seen and I want to be noticed and I want to be liked. And uh, If you are obsessive, uh, say you're... Say you like to have everything perfect. My house has to be absolutely clean. My garden has to have absolutely no weeds. My kids have to be absolutely perfect, whatever it is for you. Well, that can easily become an idol, but yet there's actually probably a bigger idol going on beneath the surface, which is the idol of control. So I, I really need a vacation. Why? Well, I just that's, that's my focus. Yeah, maybe so. But maybe the real issue is the fact of pleasure and comfort and pampering and so I, I would encourage you as you hopefully are allowing God to put your finger his finger on idols in your life don't just look for the surfacey level stuff and just go oh well yeah it's it's the fact that it's this I really need a relationship and that may be your idol and yet could be that the underlying reality of that is you're actually craving security or comfort or pleasure or whatever that may be. So realize that just what you see on the surface in terms of idolatry may not be all that's going on, and there may be actually underlying things that's actually driving the surface level things. Here's the question. Why do I really want what I want? If you look at the things that you're craving, how you're spending your time, how you're spending your money, what you're focusing upon in your mind, why is it that those things come to mind? Why are those things the very center of your focus or your desires? And typically, if you push on that hard enough, you'll actually start to see the undercurrent or the underlying reasons for the things going on in your life. Uh, in college, uh, I don't know if I should even admit this, uh, in college, uh, I went to school for business, and I actually got an emphasis in marketing which I now laugh at, uh, but and there's, in one sense, nothing wrong with marketing. Marketing is just making things, making people aware of what you have in a good sense. But there is a lot of manipulation, if I can use that term, in marketing, especially in these modern days. And the idea is, is if, if I can find your real deep desire, I can play with that so that you actually want to buy my thing my little widget, or my service, or whatever it may be. And so, uh, this morning, I was, I was finishing my study on all this. I just said, I, I'm curious, what is the typical marketer's perspective of the things that we are craving as a culture? And so, I came across this wonderful, lovely book. Don't buy it. But I, I got this, found this book, and it's called Cashvertising, how to use more than 100 secrets of ad advertising psychology to make big money selling anything to anyone. Woo! Doesn't this sound exciting already? I'm only mentioning the book just so you know the reference, but he breaks out 17 different desires that humans have. So let me just give you these from uh, Drew Whitman. He says this, there's eight primal desires that every human has. We have a desire for survival, this idea of this is, this is a secular perspective. Just, I just want to clarify that. 
So survival, we have a desire to live a long and healthy life. Protection, this idea of safety, care, and protection for yourself and loved ones. Freedom, freedom from danger, fear, and pain. Comfort, comfortable living conditions. Pleasure, enjoying food, beverages, and experiences. Relationships, sexual relations, companionship, and compatibility. Success, to be superior, winning, keeping up with the Joneses. And likability, so social approval, being a part of the quote-unquote in crowd. He says everyone has those desires. And then he says that there are nine learned desires. Now, you may not agree with all this. This is just a marketing perspective. There are nine learned desires. So efficiency, so maximum productivity with minimal effort. Convenience, the idea of saving money, time, or effort. The uh, dependability and quality, so higher standards and reliability. Cleanly, cleanliness, so a clean body and surroundings. Beauty and style, expressing yourself and uh, pleasing the senses. Intelligence, to be informed, understanding the intellectual. Sorry, uh, to be informed, understanding and intellectual. Curiosity, a strong desire to learn and discover. Profit, meaning buying and selling for profit or making something for profit. And then bargains, purchasing something below retail value. That as a culture, we are trained to value these things. And so as a good marketer, if you, if you can figure out <clears throat> what is the driving motivations for the people are, you know, in my market, then I can, in my marketing, I can play with that and emphasize your desire so that you buy my widget. Which is called manipulation, by the way. But I don't know, even just reading that list, there's a few, though, a few on that list where I'm like, oh yeah, I know that one. Oh yeah, I got that desire too. If you want to take this spiritually, um, by the way, and the reason I'm doing all this, again, is just so that you would hear the different kinds of idolatry from a variety of perspectives. So as we're walking through this, allow the Holy Spirit to be like, yep, that one, you're dealing with that one. See that one? Yep, I need to get a hold of that in your life too. So just be honest. Uh, there's this Puritan back in the 1600s called David Clarkson, and in one of the sermons that he wrote or preached, he suggests 13 acts of quote-unquote soul worship that should belong to God but which idolaters give to their idols. So here, just really quickly, here are his 13 things that we often give to something else other than Jesus. Esteem, so it's that which we most highly value. Mindfulness, that which we are most mindful of or which we think about the most. Intention, that which we aim at the most. Resolution, that which we are most resolved. Love, that which we most love. Trust, the thing that we most trust. Fear, the thing that we most fear, hope, the thing that we most hope for, desire, the thing that which we most desire, delight, that thing in which we most delight and rejoice in, zeal, that for which we are most zealous or enthusiastic or passionate or committed, gratitude, that to which we are most grateful, and then he final or he finishes with this idea of when the care and industry is more for other things than for God, that too is idolatrous. That when we crave something other than God himself. Now again, these are just different ways of saying the same thing, but we all have this weird propensity to turn to something or someone other than Jesus to meet our needs. Here's a good question. What makes you happy and gives your life meaning? Uh, Tim Keller suggests people ask this question to figure out what your idols are. Uh, he's a pastor, by the way. He says, if you ask the question, I will feel happy and my life will have meaning if blank. How would you answer that? How would you answer, I will feel happy and my life will have meaning if what? Here are some suggestions. I will feel happy and my life will have meaning if I have power and influence over others. Or if I am loved and respected by someone. If, if I have this certain kind of quality of life or if I look great or people are dependent upon me and they need me. Or there is someone there to keep me safe, or I'm completely free from obligations to or dependence on others, or maybe I'll feel happy my life will have meaning if I am being recognized for my accomplishments, or I have wealth and nice possessions, or if I keep the rules of my religion, or I'm totally independent of religion and morality, or this one person is in my life, or my children or my parents are happy and happy with me, or Mr. or Miss Wright is in love with me. How would you fill in that blank? What would give your life happiness and meaning? 
Oh, if, man, I feel like my life would be complete if what? Oh, if, if I could just obtain this, if I could just succeed in this area, if, if I could just do this one thing or have this one thing or experience this one thing, oh, I will have made it and my life will finally have meaning. Whatever that is in your life, if it's not Jesus, that's called idolatry. Uh, there's a wise scholar uh, named Ryan Priest uh, who, uh, who's on our team. And uh, Ryan's a good friend of mine, and he, he teaches Bible uh, out in Pennsylvania. And uh, we were going through this, and he came up and said, I have a list uh, you just need to see uh, that I give my students. And I was looking, I'm like, I like this list. I'm like, can I steal this list? Uh, so, so since we're kind of going through different perspectives of letting God reveal idols and trying to name our idols, let, let me give you Ryan Priest's list of modern idols. And it, this is a good list because he is a priest. So he has a, he has a very unique perspective uh, on, on idolatry. But th- this, is, this is Ryan's list of potential idols uh, in, in our lives. Materialism, meaning I need stuff. Experience, I need fun and excitement. Escapism, I need entertainment or something to forget life. Pleasure, I need to feel good. Idol- uh, ideology, I need a social cause. Relationship, I need a significant other. Family, I need family happiness. Are you, are you starting to hear these? In other words, if you're sitting there going, yeah, I need that too. I, re- I have to have that in my life. Well, there's a good case these are idols in your own life. Social life, ah, I need friends. Religious, I need tradition. Irreligious, I need free thinking. Approval, I need someone's, or I need a certain person's approval, love, and acceptance. Comfort, I need safety. Adrenaline, I need to feel danger. Suffering, I need my pain. Victim, I added these ones. Sorry, Ryan. Victim, I need others to take the blame for my problems. Scapegoat, I need to take blame for others' problems. And then here are the rest of Ryan's list. Image, I need my appearance. Networking, I need my online image. Racial or culture, I need superiority. Work, I need productivity and advancement. Helping, I need others' dependence. In, in other words, I'm willing to help other people so that they, they are dependent upon me. Dependence, well, now I need others to help me. Independence, I need freedom. Achievement, I need recognition. Power, I need control over others. Or control, I need mastery of my life. I don't know what it is for you, and we're all very different. We all had different backgrounds. We all had different past hurts and pains. And it seems like there's a lot of stuff in our past. And because of our past, we tend to turn to something to either heal the depth of our wounds or to satisfy some need, you know, something that we didn't get as we were growing up, or we're craving something, and so we're trying to satisfy some longing in our soul. Can I ask you, what are your idols? What is it that you turn to? What is it that gives you satisfaction? What is it that gives you fulfillment and joy and life? And if you're honest with yourself, is it something other than Jesus? I don't know, just going through those lists, I'm convicted. Because, I, I mean, I, I want to be a good, godly man, and I, I want my life wrapped up in Jesus, but it's so easy, as I said earlier, to have Jesus plus whatever it is. And it's not that I'm, I'm going to throw out Jesus, I just want to add something to Jesus. And I'm not actually turning to Christ to satisfy and meet my needs, rather I am turning to this or this person or this experience or this thing or whatever it may be. Would you allow the Holy Spirit to freshly examine your soul? Would you be so daring as to say, God, would you come into every crevice? Would you open up every door? Would you pull open every drawer? Would you shine your light, search and try me and see if there is any wicked way within me? And Lord, if I am turning to anything other than you, would you put your finger on it and would you name that in my life so that I can repent, so that we can tear down this idol, so that you and you alone, oh God, would be preeminent and first place in my life. And you realize that naming your idol is actually insufficient. 
you need to name your idol. If you don't know what to repent of, you don't know what to repent of. But if all you do is name the idol and be like, yes, I have this in my life, and you don't do anything about it, that's a problem. Would you be zealous like King Josiah, who, when he's beginning to take steps forward in his spiritual life, he sees the idolatry around him and says, everything must be torn down. I, I'm willing to ground into dust everything that is against the Lord my God. Would you be willing to do that in your life? Well, that's good stuff. I know. Would you be willing to set those things aside and, and fully pursue the Lord your God? It's not that relationships are bad. It's not that money is evil. But they can't have first place in your life. And if you find that those are the things that you're turning to, oh, I always turn to entertainment. Oh, I always turn to this. Oh, I am overwhelmingly addicted to this. Do you realize that that needs to be repented of? And you need to find yourself at the foot of the cross. And you need to let him heal the depth of your, of your soul. What if you pursued Christ fully? What if when you were stressed or when you had anxiety or when you were fearful or when there was pressure in your life, what if you turned to Christ first and foremost? What, what if you didn't turn to any of the addictions that you've always turned to in the past? What if you didn't turn within? What if you didn't turn to other people? What if you didn't turn to other things? And what if you fully pursued Christ and you'd allow him to be everything that you need for life and for godliness? Again, idolatry, it's looking to anyone or anything besides Jesus to meet my needs. Uh, at the very beginning of this series, I was walking through Deuteronomy chapter 6, and we were looking at the Shema, which is that famous passage that the Jews would quote every morning and typically every evening and on, the, on Sabbath. And It's interesting, if you want a good test for the soul to see if there's any idolatry in your life, all you have to do is say, say Lord, am I actually living the reality of Deuteronomy chapter 6? L listen to what this says, and this is my amplified version combining all the different uh, studies that we did over the course of the early part of this series. And so if you want to flesh this out, you'll have to go back and listen to the early episodes. But, but do you actually do this? Think about this. Moses says in Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 and 5, he says, Shema, which means to listen or to hear. Shema, O Israel, Yahweh is our God, Yahweh alone. And you shall love Yahweh your God, think about this, with all of your heart meaning your inner person, your mind, your will, your emotions, your desires, and your intentions. Do you love God with all of your heart? With all of your, what we're talking about is your inner life stuff, your, your mind, will, emotions, desires, and intentions. Do you love God with all of your soul, meaning the whole of your life, both the physical and, and the immaterial stuff, the inside stuff? Do you genuinely love God with all that you are? And do you love God with all of your might, meaning everything that you have, your talent, your ability, your possessions, your money, your time, etc.? If you were to do a true examine of your heart and your life, would the, would the results show that you love God with all that you are and all that you have? Or would it show, well, yeah, on Sunday mornings, we tend to love God, but the rest of the week... Maybe it's actually something else. Have you drifted away from that which you've been called to? Which is an exclusive and devoted relationship to the king of the universe? Have you backed away from that? And you've given him lip service and you, you nod along and you, yeah, 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 Jesus. But in reality, you actually love something more than him. Do you genuinely love God with all that you are? And all that you have, that is our calling. Let's pray. Uh, Jesus, we need you. I need you. Lord, I don't want my life to be a Jesus plus anything. Lord, I want my life to be Jesus. I want my life to be centered and built upon the reality of Christ in my life. Lord, is it possible 
that I could love you with all of my heart and all of my soul and all of my might? Is it possible for me to love you with all of who I am and everything that I have? Lord, that is what I'm craving. Lord, I I don't want to justify. I don't want to be like, well, these other little things are not that big of a deal. Lord, I want to pursue you in totality. I want to pursue you pursue you with an exclusive and devoted relationship. Lord, don't let it be Jesus plus anything in my life. And Lord, I just ask that through the power of your Spirit, would you search and try all of our hearts and our minds and our lives and our actions and our thoughts and our our deeds. Will Will you search the totality of our lives and would you, in your way, put your finger on anything and everything in our life that we are turning to to satisfy something in our life other than you. And Lord, would you bring us to the place of repentance? Lord, would you give us a zeal like King Josiah who saw the idolatry in his land and began to tear down the idols, crush them into dust, not give them a voice any longer? Lord, don't let us spiritualize our idols. Lord, let us come to the cross in humility and repentance. And Lord, would you radically do whatever is necessary in our life so that you and you alone would sit upon the throne. So Lord, we just freshly consecrate ourselves to you and ask for a tremendous movement of your life and spirit within us. We love you and we trust you. In your precious name we pray. Amen.